thanks very much. I hope you will uh, be willing to put up with some biology today. Um, so I'm an ecologist, and I work on ecosystems. And we may think about ecosystems like they're enduring parts <laughs> of nature. But in fact, they are dynamic with uh, lots of turnover of species. And so to, to understand them, you have to understand them in terms of all of the internal um, activity that's going on. But even though there's all this turnover, when you think about an ecosystem like the Institute Woods or, or like a, a lake or like the, uh, the marine system, there are regularities. And it's those regularities that we really uh, are interested in. Um, these are the regularities that characterize biomes. So for example, <laughs> this is a classic kind of um, description of ecological systems. If you know what the average temperature and the average precipitation is in a, in a region, you have a pretty good idea as to what kind of vegetation you're going to see, whether you're going to see rainforest there, or savanna, or desert. <laughs> but you, but there is still some uncertainty within this, and that's part of what I want to talk about today. And you also don't know exactly what species you're going to find in particular spaces, places. So you can't expect, just on the basis of environmental conditions, to know what species will be there. It, there as, as, uh, there's, there's a good deal of uncertainty. So <clears throat> these are the regularities that characterize biomes, and, and, and they include things like uh, predictable uh, species abundance relationships. This is uh, a distribution of the number of species, and on this axis, the number of individuals in the species. This characteristic log normal distribution is pretty resilient to changes. All of this, I think, implies a, a need to relate phenomena across scales, going from cells to organisms, from organisms to collectives, from collectives to ecosystems and to the biosphere, and to ask questions like, how robust are the properties of ecosystems? And how can we understand that robustness at the macroscopic level in terms of microscopic properties on ecological and evolutionary timescales? Um, and can we develop what I should put in quotes here is the statistical mechanics of ecological communities, and ultimately, for th things I'm interested in, of coupled human environmental systems because, uh, of course, human systems are also systems made up of lots of individual agents. I'll come back to that. So what that means is for, you know, for the management of ecosystems, and indeed for the understanding of them, <coughs> we need something equivalent to this, something that recognizes <coughs> that there are macroscopic patterns that emerge from microscopic interactions, but they somehow don't depend on all of the details. And how do we extract what the statistical properties are. So I think a perspective from mathematics and physics can help here. Um, and the, fourth, the four general areas I want to touch on today are one, what does it mean to have a statistical mechanics of ecological communities? Are there critical transitions in these systems, sudden changes from one state to another? <clears throat> What's the importance of collective phenomena and collective motion, which I showed you in the first slide and which I'll talk about, the emergence of pattern and the statistical mechanics of these ensembles. And what I, do, what I find one of the most interesting aspects of it, and I won't have much time to talk about today, is conflict and collective action. <clears throat> In any system of this sort, there's conflicts between levels. Evolutionarily, the interests of the individual cells even is not the same as the organisms they make up. As we organize ourselves into, into societies, the interests of individuals are in conflict with the uh, the interest of the society and some of the greatest challenges uh, in, in the management of environments is how do you resolve these conflicts. But indeed, these are conflicts that evolution has had to tackle over and over again. And I won't talk about them, but they arise you know, in terms of plants competing for resources. Um, the branching structure of a tree is not only to, um, to access resources best, but also to interfere with neighbors' abilities. To do that, these are there are problems uh, for, analogous to ones that you would find in animal societies, uh, where individuals are competing for resources, uh, and where the collective good doesn't necessarily emerge from that, or doesn't usually emerge. So let me start with the statistical mechanics of ecological communities, and even the very simplest models of ecological competition. This is from work that Rick Durrett and I did some years ago where one has nothing but an interacting particle model of individuals competing on the grid 
pattern can emerge in these systems very simply. And um, it's pattern that, uh, especially for where they're a finite size system, um, will depend on initial conditions. There may be multiple stable states. Much more sophisticated versions of these have been used uh, in forest communities to, to take a, a forest the size of the Institute Woods to give individual plants rules by which they interact with each other using data on what their growth characteristics are um, and how they shade each other out, et cetera, to reproduce in a general way what the dynamics of forests are. You, know, you wouldn't expect, as you could see, this is something that had a lot of spatiotemporal movement, so you wouldn't expect to tell you exactly where uh, particular trees would be found at, at any point in time, but the statistical properties of the forest can be well predicted by these models. As you move to broader scales... Can I ask you, like, in this last... Yeah. What, what, how do you model it? Sir? So this, th th these are agent-based models, obviously. On this, th this simulation was actually from a paper we published, but a lot of the work has been done by the people I put at the top. Um, they, you begin from studies of um, what the growth characteristics of plants of different species are, what their shading characteristics are. You build a model. Uh, the initial models that Pakala built here, for example, were very detailed, um, not much more than regressions on how plants shaded each other out. But in, over time, he has um, done a great deal on, to try to simplify these models. To, and I'll talk a little bit about these sorts of ways to, to do that. But all you're doing here is, is growing individual plants and giving them rules by which they grow and how they interact with others. All right. Similar work has been, uh, okay. Um, these, these models have been scaled up uh, to the global level and, um, and interface with general circulation models to make, try to make predictions about climate change and how it's going to influence uh, species abundance. At the global scale, you wouldn't expect to predict the dynamics of um, or the abundances of particular species, but you would expect to do particular species types. It's not just forest systems where this has been done. Uh, Mick Follows and his group at uh, MIT have been trying to make predictions about the distribution of largely phytoplankton, but also uh, bacterial species in the oceans. So the model, the, the way Follows group has approached this and mix a fluid dynamicist is here with, a, with an approximate uh, Navier-Stokes type description, but also um, he's used a more detailed fluid dynamic model in which you embed, in this case, nutrients, phytoplankton and zooplankton of different species um, in an interactive network where you use information about um, uptake, of the, uptake of nutrients by the, by the uh, different species um, and information about herbivory. And what he done, does in this model is to throw about 100 species together and just let them sort out and to do this over and over again. And so he solves the equations numerically, right? And he can make predictions about not where individual species are again, but where groups of species like diatoms and large eukaryotes uh, can be found. Is that my uh, old professor who just came in here? Yep. So I, I, I was a mathematics uh, undergraduate at Johns Hopkins <laughs> in the 1950s, and one of my first courses uh, that Jerry Washnitzer taught was on uh, uh, was on called Modern Algebra. Um, Burkhoff and McLean was the book. So <laughs> I, I, I enjoy that. Anyway, <laughs> back, back, back to work. So these models can predict um, not where individual species can be found, but where individual, what he calls, ecotypes. And we've been trying, uh, both for the, for the forest and for the oceans and some of other people, to simplify these descriptions by um, aggregation and simplification. For example, moment closure methods that uh, can allow you to um, average over the uh, statistical uncertainties. The, the key point is that ecosystems and the biosphere are what have been called complex adaptive systems. 
That means they're made up of heterogeneous collections of individuals that, it, that compete with each other. And so is, the, so is your body made up of, uh, your body a complex adaptive system. A lot of work going on now on the gut microflora, uh, the organisms that, uh, that live in your gut. And, and I've got a student working on probiotics and what happens when you take them. Um, but the, the, the nature of these systems is that patterns emerge which obviously emerge from the inter individual interactions, but can't depend on every detail. And so the question is, how do you scale? And it's not just the ecosystems in the biosphere, but also the socioeconomic systems um, that with which they're interlinked that are these complex adaptive systems. Why is this important? Well, these are systems that obviously have dynamics on multiple spatial and temporal and organizational scales. Patterns self-organize and you don't know which way they're going to go, so there's some unpredictability. Systems have multiple stable states, so path dependence is important. The potential for hysteresis if you try to recover from a perturbation. And the potential, as we saw uh, in the economic markets, for uh, contagious spread and systemic risk and for destabilization uh, of the systems due to, to the, the slow variable changes. In, in 2008, um, this was six months before the Lehman Brothers and the collapse. Bob May, whom many of you will know, and George Sugihara and I wrote a paper um, in Nature. This actually emerged from a meeting on systemic risk that Timothy Geithner had organized at the New York Fed. And uh, <laughs> we said, we said uh, you know, these financial systems look a lot to us like food webs, ecological food webs. And they look really interconnected. And, uh, but that seems worrisome. We said, who knows, for instance, how the present concern over subprime loans will pan out. <laughs> um, so that was five years ago. And I wish I had not only written this paper, but read it. Because I, you know, I thought, well, that's theory and nothing. But uh, many of you know what happened six months later. Um, because of your paper. <laughs> it, it might be. It, 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 might, it, it may well be. <laughs> so. Um, um, anyway, uh, so that raises the question of critical transitions, the potential for systems fl to flip from one stable state to another. Now, there, there's been a lot of interest in this recently. Uh, this is a paper I was part of in science last year called Anticipating Critical Transitions, but it followed on uh, several other papers that people had written asking, um, are there early warning indicators when systems are... Um, on the verge of transition to a new system. Now, although there's been a lot of interest in this recently, it's obviously not a new problem. It's not a new problem in, in physics where one's interested in transitions uh, from uh, one state to another. Uh, and it's not a new problem in mathematics, but uh, framed in a different way. <laughs> when I was at uh, Cornell in the, in the late 60s, uh, there was a lot of interest in a paper that Rene Thoma had published in Topology and, and subsequent publications where he um, classified all the elementary catastrophes, taking systems uh, in, uh, in which the dynamics were such that the right-hand side of the equations w were, was the gradient of a potential, so these systems behaved in a very nice way. And if you looked at the lowest order polynomials uh, and how they can do this, you could classify and identify a number of uh, different ways systems could lose uh, stability. But, of course, this got oversold. Um, if A implies B, that doesn't mean when you see B, uh, A is responsible. And so people started to see these cusp catastrophes, et cetera, all over the place and said, aha, Tom's theory explains everything. And so it collapsed under its own weight because people no longer believed it. Um, but many such transitions do have characteristic signals that people look at. For example, critical slowing down, the tendency of the system as the basin of attraction gets eroded to return to the equilibrium at a slower rate. Uh, increasing variance, which we may be seeing in climate, for example. Increasing autocorrelation, these are not independent of each other, and maybe flickering from one basin of attraction to another. Um, so again, there's a lot of interest in exploring this, but again, there's the potential for um, over-interpretation. Not all transitions uh, give these sorts of signals. Uh, Per Bach, uh, who popularized the notion of self-organized criticality, the idea 
that uh, is illustrated by this example. If you drop sand on a table, it will start to build up and it will become more and more um, subject to collapse, but, um, uh, but you can't predict when the collapse is going to take place. And when the collapses do take place, they follow a power law description. So there are lots of ways that uh, systems can lose stability. Uh, Bob May, uh, 35 years ago, wrote this article on thresholds and breakpoints in ecological systems, trying to identify those cases. So we've been working on this, and this is for Peter. Um, I'm going to talk about South Africa in just a moment. Uh, so within that vegetation diagram I showed you at the beginning, there was a region where you might get savannas and you might get forested areas. And if you look at, a, at the data that come from the MODIS satellite system, these are remotely sensed data, you'll find areas where the, where the precipitation and temperature tell you there ought to be savanna, and there are. And you'll find places where there ought to be forest, and there is, say over here. But then there are broad regions where you might get savannas and you might get forest. And uh, uh, indeed, obviously, there's a spatial effects, but these are bistable regions. This tells you right now some of these, this area is savanna um, and uh, others are in forest, but this, this could change. Um, and in fact, if you look at vegetation maps, what you'll find is in, in intermediate precipitation, you'll find e areas that are either heavily vegetated or very little vegetation. And we think the reason for this is fire, so we set out to model this. Now, wh how does fire determine this? Well, grass burns. Uh, in fact, may have an adaptation to burn because when it burns, it burns the saplings of the savanna trees that would come to displace the grass. And therefore, it's a self-sustaining state. But if the trees ever get above a certain level, then they can uh, uh, resist the fire, and now you have a forested system. Um, so this is a uh, typical savanna grassland with uh, a few trees interspersed in it. This is in Kruger National Park where my student worked. Uh, and this is the simple model that we set up to try to reproduce these dynamics. Um, so the idea is land is either covered by grass or saplings or adult trees. And th these equations simply describe the transition from one state into another. And, th and the critical part of this is that um, um, oh, by the way, this term is left over from another slide. I should have removed that term. It'll come up later. Um, the critical term is this omegas of G, which is the rate at which saplings progress to trees. And it's a function of the probability of fire. And fire is, uh, um, is promoted by, by um, grass. And so the, the transition from uh, saplings to trees goes down as grass levels go up. Uh, indeed, um, one of my postdocs, Emanuel Scherzer, who was a student of Chuck Newman's, whom some of you will know, uh, has been working on a stochastic model of fire, uh, which can, uh, from first principles, give us the shape of this function. So it's very simple to analyze th this th system there, th just by setting th the various terms in, in this equation um, equal to zero, there are two isoclines, and it's the crossing points of those isoclines that determine the equilibrium points. Um, and depending on the, the nature, largely, of, uh, of precipitation levels, you may only have one crossing point uh, at low grass levels, or one at high levels, or there's a region in which you get bistability in the system. Very easy to analyze and show that this system is bistable. This looks a lot, actually, like uh, one of, one of um, René Tom's uh, catastrophes. If you look at precipitation level on this level, and this is the amount of vegetation, the system can either exist um, at high levels of precipitation in a, a system that has very little grass in it, that's a heavily forested system, or at low levels of precipitation, it's going to be dominated by grass, but there's this large intermediate region where the system can flip back and forth. Um, what this means is that as rainfall changes, for example, due to climate change, uh, the potential for the system to flip is rapid. There may be threshold transitions. They may not be easy to reverse. 
And we also see similar phenomena in a variety of other ecological systems. We've also looked at a more complicated version of this in which we not only have these savanna trees, but forested trees in the system. And um, this has all kinds of interesting dynamics, including um, heteroclinic cycles that hop back and forth between two loops. And we don't know whether this is just a mathematical artifact or not, but we're, um, one of our projects is now to, to try to look for these sorts of transitions and periodicities in the data uh, and to try to measure the parameters to see what region we're in. So these are nonlinear or ordinary differences. There, there's no explicit time. They're autonomous equations, okay? Um, but still can give rise to this complicated behavior. But I don't know whether this is a, a meaningful complicated behavior. So let me turn now to, um, to collective phenomena and collective action. Um, about 50 years ago, Phil Anderson wrote a, a, a very influential paper called More is Different, which said if you're trying to understand complicated, complex systems, um, it's not enough just to add up the parts. You can't take a purely reductionist approach. There are emergent phenomena. Uh, so for example, when we've, this is work with uh, two postdocs and Ignacio Rodriguez at Turbe at Princeton, um, we've been trying to reproduce some of the data, some of the patterns that one sees in the vegetation. Simple model, local growth, and the potential for disturbances to spread, and one can reproduce, um, this is a, this shows clusters of different sizes, we can reproduce uh, those dynamics. But it's very easy to get uh, power laws uh, from simple models. Um, one often sees more complicated. This is a vegetation pattern, so-called tiger bush patterns. Uh, and Marone and all and others have modeled this um, using a model that was suggested by Alan Turing. So Turing was interested in problems in developmental biology. How is it that you can take an undifferentiated egg with no pre-pattern and from this it will reliably develop into uh, organisms like us who are different but look similar? And Turing's idea was that there were two morphogens, two chemicals, one an activator, the other inhibitor. The activator stimulated the production of both species, the inhibitor damped both. Um, in a well-mixed situation they would just reach some equilibrium. But if you let them diffuse out on a plate in which um, the inhibitor diffuses at a much higher rate, then, and, and you then you study the stability of that system to perturbations of different wavelengths, when the ratio of the two diffusion coefficients gets above a certain amount, the system becomes destabilized. The way you can think about it is the activator builds up locally, stimulates the production of the inhibitor. The inhibitor ought to damp down the activator, but it keeps diffusing away, so the activator keeps going. Meanwhile, the inhibitor is places it shouldn't be, and so it breaks symmetry. And you can, you can show, although Turing never did this, um, you can show that, um, um, that this initial breaking of symmetry gives rise to non-uniform spationary patterns. So there's been a lot of interest in that as models of pattern formation, not so clear. It's, really describes what's going on in development. So Lee Siegel and I, who actually had done the nonlinear theory for this, um, got interested in pattern in other systems. In the plankton, the, pattern, the, the, the plankton are very patchy, but these sorts of models don't work there. We, th we thought they did, but they give the wrong patterns out, and that's because what we, what we looked at here, the air activator and air inhibitor, were phytoplankton as the activators and zooplankton as the inhibitors. Um, but the model assumes passive diffusive movement, and zooplankton don't move randomly, they aggregate. So we started looking at aggregation models, uh, collective motion, which is very important. Now that's been looked at in lots of different systems. Anybody who hasn't seen this before can guess what this is here. These, these are wildebeest. These are naturally occurring fronts of wildebeest moving through the system. So there's tens of thousands of wildebeest um, who just form these um, fronts. Um, bacterial systems, slime molds, insects, a whole bunch of species for which um, endogenous pattern formation has been looked at. Um, my student, Danny Grunbaum, set out to model this. Um, and his approach we've extended here. I should, this, you can't see it down here. This is a paper 
that we wrote with Glenn Flarell at MIT. And the approach that Danny took and that we took in this paper is to say, how do you move from these individual based rules to some description of the population? And the way to, to do it is to write a, a velocity density um, function, a density function for, for space and a velocity at time t plus delta t and express that in terms of an integral over all previous configurations multiplied times the probability of transition and to utilize information either from experiments or from hypotheses about what the rules are by which individuals um, change their positions. So the approach to this is to write down rules, Lagrangian descriptions for every individual, to develop a statistical mechanics based on that, and then to try to go from that to an Eulerian or continuum description. And to do that, you have to have some closure rule. You have to have some rule that says, for example, the um, probability of finding 0, 1, 2, 3 individuals in my neighborhood is some function a known function of what the density is there. So that works actually, and it works pretty well to give you um, continuum descriptions uh, as long as you have the closures. Um, and if you don't, then there are new techniques that, um, for example, Yanis Kavrikides has been pioneering in which even without the closure, you can use the microscopic description as a simulator to produce the, um, the tangent fields that you would need. Um, but all of these approaches um, assume homogeneous assemblages. And real aggregations are made up of heterogeneous assemblages of individuals. So these are the starlings I showed you at the beginning. It's just it's remarkable. Oh, well, these are almost all starlings, but there's one hawk that you'll see there. <laughs> and that hawk, that hawk is driving all of this action. So we, we discussed at lunch whether there are leaders and followers here. It's impossible to think about this as anybody being uh, exclusively a leader or a follower. It's also, my degree was in fluid dynamics, impossible to look at this and not think there must be some uh, ways to describe this in terms of the macroscopic properties. So with my postdoc and now colleague Ian Cousin, I will tell you that our, I was mentioning at lunch our work has recently been singled out for special mention by Rand Paul as, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a terrific waste of money by the, by the military, but in fact I'll try to argue for you why it's not. Um, so Ian does experiments on fish, not these fish, but the fish in the laboratory. Uh, and we set out to try to understand what the roles of leaders and followers were. So the model is, that we looked at is a very simple one, an extension of the one I just showed you. Every fish has a given velocity vector, direction it's moving, and it changes its velocity vector at discrete points in time in relation to two factors. One, this vector g, namely its intrinsic information about where it ought to be going, having nothing to do with anybody else. And d, which is what its neighbors are doing. Now, there are variants on this, do I mean um, my n nearest neighbors or all the neighbors in some neighborhood, of course we can explore that. And secondly, what we've done, I don't think I put up, well maybe I did put up the uh, equation next, yeah I did, um, is what you do is here is you weight um, what, what you, we call the social vector with your informational vector. Every individual is different. Uh, the social vector is the some weighted average of the positions and velocities because they respond to both of your neighbors. GI is your intrinsic information. And uh, omega is the weighting you give to your own information. So if omega is zero, you do nothing but follow. If omega is infinite, you do nothing but you pay no attention to anybody else. Um, and in some of the work, we allowed omega to be updated. So if you're going in one direction and you realize nobody's following you, you maybe become more of a follower. So I'll only tell you a little bit um, about this. Um, but we've been doing a lot of work on this system. And in the first video I'll show you, there are 100 individuals, 99 of whom are pure followers, and one of whom has a tendency to lead and wants to go up here. So with one leader and 99 followers, the group doesn't do much of anything. Uh, with, if I increase to five 
the number of informed individuals, then the five individuals find their way to the front and haltingly lead the group to the front. If I increase that five to 10, then the group moves rather dramatically to the front. So you can see that animal groups can be led by a very small number of individuals. These are groups of different sizes. The red is the largest. And this is the proportion of informed individuals. This is how fast they move up towards their target. In fact, it's more informative to just look at the number of informed individuals. And then by the time you get to five or 10 individuals, independent of the size of the group, you move about as efficiently as you can up towards the target. But what if not all the leaders want to go the same place? Here, five of them want to go here, and five want to go there. Then, um, then the group, if the difference is not too great, will split the difference. But um, at some point, there has to be some kind of a bifurcation. Either the group goes one way or the other, or it splits. And all of those things can happen. So here, for example, five individuals want to go here, and five want to go here. There's a little bit of argument. Um, uh, the next one, which I think of as a model for a political party, is that this can also happen. <laughs> the group goes here, and then it goes, now, now why does it do that? It does this because the model is actually has a stochastic component to it. So when the group gets up to, up to here, then all of the individuals who wanted to go here are pointing, but they, they're, they're not all in the same place, so their arrows are not coherent with each other, whereas all the ones that want to go down here are pointing down here. So, I think of this as a model of political parties, or what should be, which is that the party that's in power then turns to infighting. Um, now, what if there's an unequal number of leaders? Well, then, in this the simple model, I, I'm not going to sh show you, but I'll tell you a little bit about them, uh, some other systems. As soon as you weight things so more individuals want to go one direction than the other, then almost always the group goes that, um, that direction. We've done some work that I'm not going to talk to you about. Um, except in the next minute, that was published last year in Science in which we um, allowed for a, a majority of individuals to go in one direction, but the minority held their views more strongly uh, and looked at that trade-off. And it's very easy for Ian to train his fish to do that uh, because he rewards them and, and depending on the strength of the reward, uh, their, their tendency to go to particular targets can be manipulated. And then um, you can trade off the number, the relative numbers that want to go with one direction to, to the um, to strength with which they hold that view. What? Bekshish. Bekshish. <laughs> so we, we set out to, um, to, together with Naomi Leonard, who is a control theorist at Princeton, to try to understand this system. The simplest model we built was to say, OK, let's forget about explicit space and just think about the, uh, uh, the direction individuals want to go, theta. So this is a coupled oscillator model due to Kuramoto. Forget this term k for a moment. So what this says is some individuals want to go in direction 1. And so theta j bar for them is the sign of theta 1 bar minus theta j. And that'll drive them in that direction. These individuals want to go in direction 2. And these individuals don't care. They're, um, they're just followers. What's the bar? The average? What's what? Oh, that's just a, a, particular, a particular direction. That's a fixed direction that that group wants to go. OK, so in, in, in the videos I showed you before, okay. there, there, yeah. Except here it's a direction rather than a position. These are the leaders or not? So, at the, at the, that's a definitional thing, but these are individuals who left to their own would all go to theta 1 bar. Whether they're leaders or not depends on the strength of this term I didn't tell you about yet. So this term says everybody also takes the average of what everybody else is doing with a weighting k. So whether they're leaders, th these are relative leaders, whether they're leaders or followers depends on how big k is. Okay. So the nice thing about this system is you can show formally, mathematically, it's a gradient system. The system goes to um, an equilibrium. Um, we describe the various groups by um, adding up the e to the i thetas for them, uh, expressing that in polar coordinates, r e to the i psi. So r is the measure of synchrony in a, in a particular group. 
and C is the average direction of the group, and what we're able to show is that on the fast time scale, all the individuals in this group go into one cluster, all the individuals in this group go into another cluster, and all of these individuals um, go into a third cluster, and then they interact on a slower time scale. So I can differentiate that, and um, what that means is that on, within a particular cluster, uh, Rj becomes equal to 1, effectively. Uh, all of the thetas have the same directionality, and then we can look at the group on the slower time scales. This will just give you a cartoon of what's going on. The five red individuals want to go here in that direction. The five blue individuals want to go here. The black individuals are the ones that don't care. And what happens is, and this is the fast time scale, dynamics, the individuals sort out, the red individuals all end up in one cluster, the blue individuals in one cluster, and the black individuals in the middle. And then, on the slower time scale, we get uh, dynamics for the average velocity, uh, the average uh, angle of that group. And Naomi's student, Ben Nobbitt, looked at this for all of the possible coupling parameters to try to see how much of the bifurcation that we were seeing could be reproduced. So some preliminary conclusions out of this um, is that we found that the uninformed, the naive individuals, were very important to consensus. If you didn't have that third group in there, the group would split. And some individuals would go one direction, some in the other direction. Um, so we've done a lot of exploration of, of um, uninformed individuals. Um, we couldn't get everything, so these non-spatial models miss some of the detail, and the multi-scale analysis is essential. So then we began to look at more complicated topologies. And I'll just say a little bit uh, about that. This is a paper that we published in PNAS uh, 2011, I think. And the idea here is this looks exactly like what I wrote before, but the difference is that these AJs, which are the coupling coefficients, are now functions of time. And how are they functions of, of time? Everything else is the same. How are they functions of time? Well, I, I won't take you into all of the detail, but basically they change according to rules that say if you're, if you're sufficiently close to particular individuals in your angle, then the coupling becomes stronger. And if you're beyond some threshold, the um, coupling becomes weaker. And so that strengthens the individuals that now self-organize uh, into group. I, I think I won't, this is a description of what I just said, but I think I won't go through this. But um, what I wanted to show you is, that, again, there are slow and fast time scales. Again, the uninformed individuals are crucial. And we analyzed this by using singular perturbation theory. Remember, K was the coupling parameter. Um, and it turns out there are eight invariant manifolds. Uh, and they look like something of this sort. It may be that the individuals in uh, group one and the individuals in group three become associated with each other, uh, but the individuals in group two go off their own direction. So that's one possible outcome. Now, interestingly, um, oh, and so these are the dynamics on the slow time scale, but these A's, these capital A's, which are the emergent coupling parameters, turn out to, to all be either zero or one. Zero if they're coupled together, uh, I'm sorry, one if they're coupled together and zero if they're not. And so this will give you some idea of the complexity of this system. Each one of these uh, eight manifolds refers to, um, to what those AIJs are. So each one could be either zero or one, so there are eight possible ones. Uh, two of them are inherently unstable, can never be stable. Uh, they're, they're all invariant manifolds, but if you go off of them, they're not stable. But any of the others could end up being stable. And in fact, in this case here, five of them are simultaneously stable. So it's an extremely complicated uh, system. I just want to say a few words at the end here about conflict and collective action so you know why I'm interested in it. Um, these are all problems of um, what, what are called public goods. In this case, information is a public good. So these are krill, or these are idealized krill. And imagine if, you're, if these animals are searching for food on some food landscape. 
and they search by climbing gradients. So this is the resource gradient, and if I'm searching alone, I may go up here and I'll end up here, but that's not as good as the one that climbs this hill. So we could, um, we could benefit from sharing information with each other. Um, indeed, if everybody only searched on their own, then that obviously wouldn't be optimal. If everybody did nothing but follow everybody else, they'd all be in one nice group, but that wouldn't be such a good idea either. So from the group's point of view, the optimal thing would be some, um, some mixture of search and, um, and follow. But this is not optimized from the collective point of view. It's a game theoretic problem in which each individual is following its uh, own information and trying to maximize its payoff. How many leaders arise? How many followers? What's optimal from the viewpoint of the group? Uh, Naomi Leonard has a student who recently showed that the most robust thing for the group for to, to do is for every individual to follow about six or seven other individuals. But there's no reason to assume that that's what's going to arise uh, evolutionarily. We need game theoretic solutions. And I'm interested in it because there, there are lessons for cooperation uh, in the global commons. This is Naomi. What she, the reason she got interested in this is she puts robots out into the ocean to collect information. And um, those robots exchange information with each other. And the result is some self-organized optimal coverage of an area. But she got interested in how it is that animals do this and what might be learned. And so the difference between her systems and ours is that she can optimize from the top down, whereas our systems are self-organized in a game theoretic point of view. So we've been looking at a suite of models, depending on what the level of selection is, to see what the differences are. So a variety of papers have resulted, and I'll only tell you about um, one of them, this one down here, Vishu Guttal, who was a postdoc with us, and uh, Ian Cousin, looked at a model in which there were two pr evolvable parameters. One is gradient detection ability, and the other was sociality. How much you invest in tracking gradients, how much you, in you invest uh, in following other individuals. And of course, if you put all of your emphasis on sociality and nothing on detecting the gradients, you'll get what amounts to a Brownian swarm, individuals that are associated with each other but don't have any idea where the food is. Um, if you don't put investment in, in either, then you'll just have individuals that are randomly walking. Um, if you put everything into gradient detection and nothing into sociality, then you'll get solitary individuals that are migrating, climbing those local hills. And this is the most interesting case of um, collective migration. But what they did in their model, what we've done in ours, is to put different types in, in competition with different trade-offs of these and ask who wins out. And one of the interesting things they found, this was a paper published in PNAS, is that the group could split into leaders and followers. Uh, certainly under other circumstances, you might expect so everybody to have a little bit of each. But the group so self-organized um, into, into producers and scroungers, leaders and followers. Okay, so let me just um, draw a couple conclusions. What I've tried to do today is to, um, first of all, emphasize collective phenomena. And collective phenomena and emergence, I think, characterize a whole range of systems, from economic systems to microbial communities to the biosphere. Uh, a fundamental challenge is how do you scale from the microscopic level to the macroscopic level how do you form consensus in order to maximize the benefits to the group? And uh, I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, there is not only potential for mathematics and physics to make, to inform these sorts of studies, but hopefully as in the past, these will stimulate new, new questions in mathematics and physics. So thanks very much. Uh, you mean on the previous, the, the previous slide? So that's not my work, but I can explain to you what's going on anyway. Um, all that's, they, that's built into this model 
is that uh, you have a population of individuals who are rewarded for, um, for how well they find the food. Um, and they can either search for the food by um, investing in gradient tracking or inv investing in following others. But there's a trade-off between them, so they can't do both. So the question is, in, uh, in a population made up of large numbers of individuals, what will happen in a game theoretic sense? And what you get is, um, at least in, in this example here, is a mixture of strategies. You might also get a mixed strategy, but you get a mixture of strategy in which some individuals um, have um, become searchers and some have become followers. Obviously, if this reaches an equilibrium, the average payoff to either strategy has to be the same, or else there'd be selection to shift. So you end up with a, with a mixture of strategies uh, in, in which both are equally uh, valid. We've, we've looked at other models of this, of this sort, for example, of, of cooperation and defection in dealing with public goods. This is really a, a quest, question of cooperation and defection because um, the searchers are paying a price to search, uh, but they get to the food faster. So that's the benefit of them being there. Um, so this is not an uncommon. So, so there are two answers. To, there are two answers to that question. One of the the answers is um, why 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 does one want to study golden shiners? Or fish? It, it's not that we uh, uh, care so much about those fish, but those fish themselves are potential models for for other systems. So the first thing you can ask, and and, and this is the easier part, is uh, Ian does controlled experiments. In the fish populations, you can, you can test this. Uh, you can train them according to particular targets. You can see to what extent the models described. That's where you, you actually determine parameters. So that's where you could actually determine parameters for it. Now the question is, um, what can you extrapolate from this to tell you about other systems for which you can't measure those parameters? And then things become more speculative. So you can answer questions about, but that's, that's true in general. In, you know, in biology, when you're working on a model system, you can test things for that particular system and, and see, how the, see how yeast behave or something of that sort. But if you want to extrapolate from that and say, and therefore we can conclude uh, that this is a, a general phenomenon, then, then, then it's a little harder to do. And it's a lot harder to do. So in the, um, in, in the fish population, what he has done is to train, train, a fit, train, train fish to particular targets. You shine a laser. If the fish comes to that, you give it a reward. And in doing that, you can, the fish learns, and you can make it more likely to want to go to where to reward. There's a general population of fish in there that haven't been trained? Is that the idea? That's correct. Okay. You don't train them all. Yeah, I understand. You, you train leaders, yeah, yeah. and then you put them in and followers. And, uh, yeah. and then, then you could observe, for example, um, you can actually observe to what extent the followers um, change their movements in response. You can, you can see when the, um, when, the, when the leading fish go towards the target, uh, and you can observe the degree to which there's a, a switch in, um, in the other fish. One's not going to do much. Well, what I was showing you there were simulations, but in fact, one leader is not going to do a lot in these populations either. You train a, a subset. And as I said, what they, we also do is um, to train fish with different degrees of fidelity to targets so that um, in, in one case, there's one group of fish who wants to go to this target, um, another group that wants to go to the other target but doesn't feel as committed to it. I mean, you can train the, in, you, you can modify the intensity of the signal, and then put the followers in. Does that help you model this and show and show, giving us some rules? I mean, when you want to do computer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
So the model I showed you is in fact the model that, um, that we use most of the time, which is a model in which individual fish have rules, pay attention to these many neighbors, um, and, um, um, and modify your movements in response to the averages of their positions or the averages of their velocities. Uh, so, the, so the individual based model that I described works pretty well for this. Um, the students who are observing the behavior in the laboratory are actually also modeling one component of it by imitating epidemic models. That is, you can, if you watch the fish, you put them in, they don't know where the target is, eventually they discover the target, they move towards it. That's analogous to an infected state. You can watch the neighbors and see at what point um, they make that transition, uh, and it says if they get infected. So you can model different components of it differently, but ultimately in trying to reproduce the population, um, models of the sort I've described uh, work pretty well, and, uh, and lots of people have used models of that kind. Well, and, and, and obviously in the physics example, you would. I, people have not been very careful about those distinctions, but should be um, with critical transitions in society. There's not, it, it, it's not identically the same kind of transition that's going on, but I'd, dynamic too. You know, the dynamics, but, I, but I'd love to talk to you about that actually, because that's a, that's a topic that's big. And, and what about the idea of self-organized criticality? Are, are you a fan of this idea, or uh, are there good examples There, uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's an intriguing idea. I understand that even for the sand piles, this is an idea that uh, has fallen out of favor. And yeah. Per Bach's been dead for 10 years, so he's not here to, um, to defend it. So um, the, the, the notion that systems may organize themselves to, to be perched on critical points is an intriguing one, but I haven't seen any data to support it, and so I, I'd be interested. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker again. Great. 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 Great.